shares at the market. Can I get a permanent at 4 o'clock? Over George Washington Bridge. Connect me with the credit department. The truck's on the way now. This is the city clerk's office. They're going to operate today. Two aisle seats in the orchestra. Bring the children, too. 3 o'clock at the first tee. Let me have train information, please. Big news, Jim. It's a boy. Thanks for calling. Thanks for calling. On March 3, 1847, one of the world's most pioneering inventors was born in Edinburgh, Scotland, Alexander Graham Bell. He emigrated with his family to Canada in July of 1870. Soon after, he moved to Boston and worked extensively with deaf students, helping them to communicate. While in Boston, he began work which was intended to improve upon the already existing telegraph service. During those experiments, he would stumble upon a discovery that would change the world. On March 10, 1876, the first ever telephone transmission took place. On July 9, 1877, the Bell Telephone Company was founded and stock was issued to the seven original shareholders. The Bell Company, seeking to build the first long distance network, formed a subsidiary company to handle the job. In 1885, the American Telephone and Telegraph Company was born. By 1892, AT&T had reached the first of many objectives, opening a long-distance line connecting New York and Chicago. Then in 1899, a dramatic reorganization would take place. The entire Bell system was reorganized, and AT&T became the parent. So from 1899, AT&T became the dominant player both in terms of local telephone traffic and in terms of long distance telephone traffic. Employing the first practical electrical amplifiers, AT&T opened up the first transcontinental telephone line in 1915 and in 1919 installed the first ever dial telephones in Norfolk, Virginia. AT&T established the famed Bell Labs as its research and development subsidiary in 1925 a move which led to even more history-making inventions in the coming 75 years. Up until 1925, AT&T had taken part in other business ventures that ranged well beyond that of the national telephone system. But in 1925, Walter Gifford, newly elevated to the presidency of AT&T, decided that AT&T and the Bell system should return its focus to its originally stated goal of universal telephone service in the United States. He then sold Western Electric, AT&T's manufacturing subsidiary, to the newly formed International Telephone and Telegraph Company, or ITT, for $33 million. Although AT&T retreated from international manufacture, it retained its international presence through its drive to provide a global telephone service to the American people. In 1927, the first commercial transatlantic telephone service was inaugurated to London using two-way radio technology. These first calls cost $75 for three minutes and were subject to fading and interference and its capacity was strictly limited. However, the service soon spread to other parts of the world. Radio telephone service to Hawaii began in 1931 and to Tokyo, Japan in 1934. Clearly, the evolution of the telephone was making the world a smaller place to live. Hello, Chicago. Hello, Atlanta. Hello, Boston. Hello, New Orleans. Hello, San Francisco, or London, or Honolulu, or Tokyo, or Rio. And all day long, someone far away is calling, Hello there, Broadway, or Wall Street, or Fifth Avenue, or Flatbush. So it is that these central offices in the city are in reality serving Cleveland, or Omaha, or Washington. Ironically enough, the Great Depression, which ended many businesses, was seen as an opportunity for AT&T. The Great Depression provided for it, uh, ironically, a great opportunity because of its uh, deep pockets and its economic uh, clout to, in a massive way, uh, purchase and buy up many of the local networks and solidify local telephone systems across the United States so that by the early 1940s, th the uh, AT&T system was clearly the dominant system and nowhere on the horizon was there another telephone company with near the uh, power or influence that AT&T had. The advances in telephone technology were created almost entirely by Bell Telephone Laboratories and in 1934 Bell researcher Clinton Davison became the first of seven Nobel Prize winners in physics for his work confirming the wave nature of the electron. 
World War II tested the Bell system's abilities to the utmost. AT&T discouraged long-distance calls so that the network could remain free for military and service personnel use. During the war, development of civilian telephone equipment came to a halt as Bell Labs went to work on over 1,200 government projects, including the development of sonar and radar. Long-range bombers carry several types of cathode ray tube indicators to give the crew just the kind of information it needs. There is an indicator which plots its information to make a map of what the radar sees. A narrow slice of radio wave sweeps across the earth far below the plane. Their reflections bring back information which appears like this on the cathode ray tube indicator. Bombs away. With radars like these, our fighting men have bombed our enemies without regard to clouds or darkness. AT&T emerged from its war efforts in a weakened financial condition. Pent-up demand created a backlog of unfulfilled orders. But as Bell Labs again returned to its own agenda, they were about to make a breakthrough that would again revolutionize the still burgeoning telecommunications industry and the world forever. <laughs>